All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Insurance Toolkits podcast. Um, I actually have a long time, not only uh, a business partner, but friend, Gabe, here. Um, I've been actually looking forward to this for, for quite some time here, um, but I will let him introduce himself so I don't do you any uh, disjustice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. My name is Gabe Ross. Um, I've been in the uh, insurance industry for about five years now. Um, my wife and I have been married uh, over 26 years. We've got seven kids. And so uh, a few years back, I was looking for some extra you know, income, a different income stream. And found uh, this industry and I've uh, really enjoyed it. Started to build a team over the last couple of years and uh, I've used insurance toolkits for a couple of years now. So it's been a huge uh, part of my business. Well, that was the first question. So thanks for answering that for me. <laughs> um, a, a good question that I have for you, and I'm really curious to hear your answer on this because um, for those of you watching, I've known, I've known Gabe, we've known each other for uh, two to three years or so. Um, and one of the biggest things that, that you helped me with a lot <clears throat> with the, on the agency side was there's a huge, this is really important, I think, for new agents to know, is there's a huge difference between placing business and getting business approved. That gap in the middle is where most agents fail out at. And it's like you can go out there and write $10,000 in a week, but if only 1500 of it gets approved, you know you just can't sustain that over the long term. And it's such a real problem that agents face. Um, obviously, we're going to be biased towards our, our platform because it's a pre-qualification software. Like, obviously, that's what we – using that in the field, you don't have to guess who it's going to get approved by anymore. But what do you think, you know, including or excluding insurance toolkits, what do you think agents, especially in their first, let's say, 6 to 12 months, should be focusing on as, like, not just turning and burning, just throwing things wherever they should land and see where it sticks. How do you think agents can kind of overcome that placing business versus getting business approved dilemma that seems to put most people out of business? Yeah, your first couple of months, I mean, all you're thinking about is just making sure you don't fall on your face, say the wrong thing. Um, and so you don't know what the products are. You don't know what the underwriting guides look like, what they say. Um, and even to this day, sometimes I don't. Right. And um, so I have new agents who come to me and go, hey, who should I write this business for? And my first answer, my first question is, did you run it through toolkits? Right. Did you put it in toolkits? Right. Because I don't I don't know. There's so much, so many carriers, so many products, so many changes that underwriting makes with each carrier that right. I can't keep up with it. So I, I lean on a tool like insurance toolkits to help me get started. But it, it, that first couple of months, you're excited. I'm just going to write a piece of business and you just assume it's going to get approved and you're going to get paid. Right? That's just the assumption until you come to the reality of, oh, just because I write the application doesn't mean I'm, it's going to get approved and I'm going to get paid. I actually have to do the underwriting work myself on the yeah. front end. And so I help my agents work through that of understanding that, you know, you do want to have a high ratio. Now, 80% is a really good ratio. Every If you get everything that you submitted, 80% of that gets approved. That's a really good ratio. I mean, sometimes you can't control what a client does and doesn't tell you uh, what the carrier might, might not approve if it's kind of on the border. Um, but I've, I've developed a four-step process uh, for my agents, the underwriting process. And the number one is to, to utilize technology. And the number one resource that I push my agents to is insurance toolkits. Now, the IMO that I work with has another um, piece of software for a couple of specific proprietary products. So we utilize both of those. Um, and so that's number one. The second would be to leverage the underwriting guides, right? The great thing about toolkits is I don't have to have 20 underwriting guides in front of me and take the time to go through those. Toolkits does that in about 30 seconds where it would take 30 minutes to run each case. Then the third thing would be if there's still questions, do a risk assessment, call the carrier, ask them specifically. And then finally, the fourth one is just to submit the application. So I kind of help train them on that four-step process, but probably 90% of the work is leveraged through insurance toolkits. It's going to give them a good starting point. And again, it, it's going to help them in 30 seconds, what used to take us 30 minutes. I remember when I first started using toolkits, I had an agent, uh, a seasoned agent text me, hey, who would you run this with? I'm literally standing in line at Lowe's uh, ordering paint. Okay. And in 30 seconds, in 30 seconds, I put it through the toolkits app and I, and I sent a screenshot. This is who I would suggest. That's awesome. <laughs> it's and that's probably one of the biggest benefits is is the in the field on the go. You don't have to refer back because it's all about efficiency in the home. Like 
we want to see as many people as we can. If you're spending all this time either in sifting through your underwriting guidelines, calling a carrier or calling your upline, when you could you could just mitigate that and just use you know a, a software. I mean that, that does make a lot of sense. Plus two, the efficiency perspective. Like when you're in the home with a client, you hopefully have more meetings throughout the day. And you know if, if you run over on one meeting, you know the whole rest of your day is is kind of shot. So it, definitely mm-hmm. from a time perspective too. Um, so one one of the other questions I have on here. So obviously with with new agents, I know one of the biggest things is. Using a quoter is great, but getting a quote for a product that you don't know which carrier they're going to qualify for is basically irrelevant. You know, if I could give cl- quotes all day long, and yeah. especially, I mean, I did like when I very first was in the business, there was there was still paper applications, and like almost all of my business was GI business through Gerber because that's just, yeah that was all that was all it was, and it's obviously yeah, that's not good for me, that's not good for the client, mm-hmm. um, but. Uh, for from a pre-qualification perspective, do you think that it gets as agents get more and more, I guess, become more veteran, they get more and more familiar. Do you think that they tend to naturally rely on things less? And as you progress throughout your career, using a pre-qualification software holds just as true ten years in as it does ten days in. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I would say the reason is because toolkits is very efficient um it takes 30 seconds literally especially if there if it's not a difficult case not a lot of medications or medical history it it takes 30 seconds and and you don't have to worry about going to the carrier site to get a quote you can go to toolkits it's going to give you all of those and there are times either in the home or virtually i do most of my business virtually these days um that i will pull it up and i will show toolkits to um to the client to say look here are the carriers Right. To, to have a little bit of legitimacy to say, I've looked through all of them, uh, all the carriers that we have. I've looked through them and look here. Here they are. Here they are listed. Now, this top one might be the cheapest, but it doesn't have as many living benefits. This one has more value because it has more benefits. And right. so that way I can show the client, um, even if I know what the quotes are, they get to see it for themselves. And I, and I don't do that all the time, but I think sometimes that provides legitimacy for the client. And then they get to say, I've made an informed decision, which means that's going to be a policy that you're going to keep on the books because you didn't force it down their throat and they might have found a cheaper price later. It actually shows them the value of the the product and policy they're choosing, which will help you have great persistency, not just issue rate as well. Right. Yeah, because your issue rate could be if you write 10,000 and 8,000 falls off, then you're back to square one again. You're trying to work an uphill battle. But the reason I kind of piece my way to that question is that's one of the things that we do on the back end is you can an, un, a rule that happened in January of 2010 is probably not going to be the same in January of 2015. And it probably won't be the same in January of 2020 and so on and so forth. So our system is constantly updating in real time. We have a full team on the back end, a full, a full time team on the back end that makes sure the underwriting, um, the per thousand rates and everything is, is up to date, current and accurate. So when it goes live with the carriers, it goes live for all the users. Um, so that's kind of why I think that that's important because even as a veteran agent, you know, someone who's been in it for five years or more or whatever, the underwriting is still going to change. It doesn't, it, <laughs> the amount of time you spent in the business doesn't mean the underwriting stops changing and what you used to know probably won't hold true anymore. We saw that a lot with COVID, you know, look how many, yeah. how much that kind of screwed things up. Um, so that kind yeah, of, and I'll say, uh, I'll say, sorry not to cut you off, mm-hmm. or I did cut you off, but I apologize, but uh, so there was a time, uh, maybe three to four months ago, where a lot of people were having difficulty with foresters. Like, I'm just not getting business issue. And and I was over here quietly saying, well, I am. And it was because toolkits was staying up to date on the underwriting. And, right. and I knew what would be approved and what wouldn't be. And, and sometimes the carrier just gets finicky, right? I mean, it might be in the guide. It might not be in the guide. And if it goes to an underwriter, they must just arbitrarily decide, you know what, that crosses the line to what we can't approve. But I was able to get more business approved because I was using a tool like toolkits. And I've been doing this for five years. Um, so I think it holds weight for a new agent uh, and, and seasoned agents as well. Yeah, and I think that another point with that too is that, um, like, not to bias any carrier, but like, especially like foresters, and, foresters and Transamerica have had a lot of underwriting changes recently, but specifically foresters with their diabetic stuff. There's mm-hmm. a lot of change there, so staying on top of that is is been challenging for us. But it, I think that it 
holds true to provide something that agents can rely on. Um, which brings me to like my next question, which is that most agents, uh, unfortunately, like we, there's this, uh, a conference called, we sponsored it the last few years, uh, it's called 8%. And it's based off the idea that 92% of agents fail out the first year, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. And um, most agents that are new to the business last about a month or maybe two, you know, if they're coming to it and they simply can't afford to stay in business. What's your opinion on working while trying to sell for a certain amount of time? Do you think that there's some benefit to saying, hey, let me go get a job as a maybe not a captive agent per se, but I'm not just going to go all in yet. Let me let me try to see if I can mm -hmm. actually get this, you know, that sort of mentality of a smoother transition, because, of course, if you go out there and you kill it for six months, that's great. But if that's where it ends, then, you know, you wasted your time. We're trying to look at longevity. So what's your kind of take yeah. on that mix? Yeah, um, it's it just depends on the person and their situation. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a long game, uh, a, a, a large barrier to entry, if you will. Um, it's not difficult, but it does take some time, you know, to go through the whole pre-licensing, licensing, appointing process. I mean, you're you're minimally at, at three to four weeks at minimum. Yeah. Um, generally, it's a little bit longer for people. So to go without income for that long is impossible for most people. Um, right. So if they have a full time job, you know, I started part time one day a week uh, and I tell that story and I say, you can do that. And, and how can we look at your schedule where you can work in about five to ten hours a week? Um, even if that's on a weekend and you don't have to do weekends forever, you don't ever have to do them. I never do weekends, like literally one weekend a month. I'm working Saturday, Saturday, typically not Sunday. Um, but I look at their schedule and say, how can we work in five to 10 hours so that you can grow in your belief in what's possible? You can start to hone your skills a little and you can put some money in your pocket that would kind of give you a, a, a runway to be able to take off to do this full time. So. If they already have a job, I encourage them to keep that job and right. do this on the side because it, it takes away the pressure. Sales, if there's pressure in sales, then you're going to push that pressure onto your client. They're going to feel that and they're going to resist the sale. Right. So that makes it even more difficult. So if you can remove that pressure from yourself and you don't have to rely on that appointment to be a sale, to put money in your pocket, then you can actually just speak a little more freely you can be in the moment a little bit more, which is going to help you be more successful. So I would encourage people, whatever job you've got, keep it or work it to where you can find five to 10 hours a week for your first couple of months as you learn the business. Right. No, I definitely, yeah, I think that's a great, I definitely mm -hmm. appreciate that feedback on there because I think a lot of agents think that it has to, because of the, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, it's certain IMOs, certain organizations, agencies, like it's, they, they make it seem like it's an all or nothing like hoorah hoorah like you had and that's that's great and it's good to have people to push you but not at the expense of you burning out and getting put in the hole and then going back to the job that you try to get out of in the first place um yeah which, so i think that those few questions did a good job on kind of capturing that first few months as an agent the other area that we see that we've been helping to try to solve um as a company but also just you know we want to spread as much knowledge as we can i know that you have a lot of experience in this too is leads Right, because without leads, whether you get leads from your IMO or you have to buy them, and you remember this is a couple of years back, me and my partner at the time were spending like a thousand dollars a week on leads, you know, and it's and and that can especially for a new agent who's coming maybe right out of the gate, they can maybe do that for two weeks, maybe three, four, if they absolutely are stretching it. And mm -hmm. it's not a sustainable long term business model if you don't have the right tools in place to act because like we talked about many times, it's a cash flow business. You gotta spend money. But you got to close the deals, but not just close deals. You got to get it paid on those deals. So it's really yeah. a three-step process. So um, obviously, there's certain IMOs that provide leads for you. There's some, you know, you can you can have a mix. Would you say that as a new agent coming into the, because it can be overwhelming for a new agent, like with all there's so many vendors that do so many different things. And one of the points that I like to make is we know that there's call centers out there. One of the biggest conversion metrics that we use to track lead is your speed to contact like you know the speed in which you get a lead until when you contact it we want those two points to be as close together as possible because there's call centers out there that they're and i've mentioned this on uh, a few episodes ago but the average speed of contact for some of these call centers is like five to seven seconds mm -hmm. 
And the average agent on, a, on an iPhone or okay. whatever, they can't compete with that. These agencies are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on technology to beat everybody out in the competition, which is why when we launched our lead platform back in January, we decided that we need to offer not only exclusive leads, but real-time exclusive leads. So these agents can work, be the only person to work that lead and work it as it comes in. What's your take on new agents coming into business? How should they tackle this ridiculously overwhelming lead space that is just getting crazier by the month? <laughs> yeah, so let me, let me address that just kind of uh, big scale high level and then dive in a little bit. So you alluded to cash flow and and sustainable business, right? So I think that's how agents have to approach this. Um, and anything that is sustainable isn't built in a day. Um, right. So so all of the, the rush, the rah-rah, that's great to get you excited, but that's never sustainable. That's like eating a candy bar and expecting it to last you all day. It'll last you an hour, but then you're gonna crash. And if you don't have any other foundation you're not going to be able to be sustained. So I think approaching this the same way, it, it's not an MLM. Uh, it, it's not a, I'm going to get rich quick. Uh, it, it is, how do I create a sustainable business that doesn't just focus on the raw, raw top number, whether that's a commission level number, contract level number, or whether that's certain number of business that's been submitted, because we know we talked about, it doesn't all get issued or stay on the books, but more of what does that look like net profit what what are my profit margins what are my returns on investment that's right. going to help me sustain and not just sustain but scale I, that's a problem i ran into in the past when you're talking about lead specifically i was fine i was successful i could be sustained but i couldn't grow a business because there weren't enough quality leads to be able to scale and, right. and so i think all those things matter so um the lead space is is insane right now you have analog leads digital leads um social media texting TikTok, lead, leads all over the board right so i think finding a lead strategy and a lead flow that fits your schedule and fits your goals really is important um so i work a lot of analog leads um they work for me because it works for my schedule um and, and all leads work all of them do yep um but but you have to work them and you have to find the ones that work best for you uh it's easy for a new agent to go these leads don't work well they do i mean this industry has been around for hundreds of years right so they do work either you don't know how to work them or you're not working properly right and and here here's really quickly and this may go a little bit more detailed than you want but this no. is what i help my new agents with um, I spend seven fifty a week on leads right now. Um, I used to spend more than that, but I spend seven fifty. Have about a seven time ROI. Um, spend about three thousand a month. Issue about twenty thousand a month. Uh, that's a pretty good ROI. Uh, I do that in about twenty five hours a week, which is pretty nice. Um, so I'm not working sixty hours a week to try to produce that. Right. Um, those are quality leads that allow me to do that in a timely manner. And I've told you this before, and I, I tell all my new agents. There's no free lunch. There's no skirting the system. There's no shortcuts. You're going to pay in one of two ways. You're either going to pay for higher quality leads and you're going to spend less time on the phone or you're going to pay for lower quality leads and spend more time on the phone. Yeah, yeah, I remember the, the ROI is going to be about the same in the end. One's just going to invest more money. The other is going to invest more time. And you have to choose what fits best for you. And you need a, a manager, an upline, whatever that is, that's going to help you work that strategy and that schedule. Here's the other thing I tell agents too is you remember when you were little, your parents didn't just put you on a mountain bike right, right, right away because you're going to fall off, hurt yourself, and you may back away. I think sometimes we do new agents a disservice by saying you've got to buy these leads, these leads, these are the newest, freshest, most expensive. They fall off the mountain bike week one and they're like, ooh, I'm out. I invested too much money. I'm afraid this isn't going to work. Right. So I, I use an analogy with my agents of, you remember when you were little, they started you out on a Hot Wheels. It was so low to the ground. If you fell over, you might hurt yourself, but not so badly that you didn't want to do it again. Right. Then as you grew, you got a little bit more older and more mature. They put you on a tricycle. Then they moved you to training wheels. Then the training wheels got a little higher on the bike. Then the training wheels disappeared and they ran beside you. Then you rode freely for yourself for a couple of years and then you graduated to the mountain bike and you just took off. Right. That's the way it is with leads. You don't necessarily want to start on the mountain bike, but you're not always going to stay on the Hot Wheels. Yeah. And so it's going to be a progression as you develop skills, your craft, understand the business, and, and we'll move you through that process as you get better 
uh, and have more experience. So that's kind of the way I approach it. Yeah, and I think I remember that like summer ish of twenty one. I remember you saying the the time versus money thing, and I like as you're saying that it brought me back to um, the point that we talked about a few moments ago, which was as an agent, if you're if you're still working a job and while you're doing this, maybe one day a week, we'll say. That means you have a little more money to invest and you don't have as much time. So right. maybe you can kind of lean towards, I'm going to spend a little more money on leads so I spend less time on the phone. Because most people, what you're doing in 25 hours a week, most people aren't doing in 80 hours a week. Because yeah. they don't, it's not, they don't, they're not playing the game right, if you will. Yep. So I, I think that was, uh, if I could just snip at that last three minutes, I think that was a huge, huge value add to people watching. Um, and then uh, the last question is, A, what advice do you, would, just generically would you have for new agents that want to come into this business? And for those agents, how could they get a hold of you, like email if they wanted to reach out to you, if they wanted to work with you? Um, how could yeah. They do that? yeah, so um, just, just advice for somebody wanting to get into this. I would do your homework. Um, not not every company is the same. Not every IMO is the same. They're, they're just not. Um, a lot of them have the same carriers, right. um, but you have to consider um, availability of leads, quality of leads. You have to consider um, the, the vision and direction of the company. Right. Uh, you have to consider uh, the technology that's being utilized. Uh, you have to consider the innovation that's being um, taken and considered. Uh, and, and then the culture. Because because every business has a personality and a culture, and you may not fit in a certain one. You may fit in another one better. So I would say take your time, do your research, ask questions, ask questions of other people. I would say this too: be careful. Don't trust the internet. I mean, <laughs> you're going to find good reviews and bad reviews. You need to talk to people. You need to to talk to uh, people who've done it, people who've been in it, and not not people who've done it and tried it and half tried it and stepped out because they don't have a real experience. Um, right. So. I'd say do your homework, ask questions, um, take your time. Obviously, you don't want to take forever, but take your time because this is a, a personal decision and a business decision. It's not a fly by night, not a get rich quick. If anybody tells you it is, it's not. I mean, it, it takes a couple of years to to really be successful. Now, you could be successful day one, week one. You know, I, I mean, I remember um, I think I did 6,000 in my first two weeks, but um, I worked my tail off for that. Right. Um, so you can be successful quickly. I don't mean that, but um, it, it's just not a, a, a quick thing that you're going to jump into because if you get burned, you're going to jump out. And if that happens too many times, you're just going to step away. And this is too great of an industry uh, to, to allow that to happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I am growing a team, building a team. I uh, love to help other agents be successful, love to help them produce personally and also help them to learn to build a team as well. So um, they can reach out to me. Um, I don't know if you want me to give them phone number and email here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, OK, phone number is 256-642-1216. And then my email, uh, the easiest is Gabe, G-A-B-E, at Ross, R-O-S-S dot agency. You know, dot com, just Gabe at Ross dot agency. Perfect. Yeah, and I have your information. Yeah. So I'll put it in the description too. So if they didn't catch that, yeah. they've got to rewind. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so I, I think that was uh, super, super valuable. So I really appreciate your time. Um, and everybody watching, yeah, if, if you want to reach out, uh, I'm going to put the contact information below. If you have any questions, you can always shoot me an email if you have any questions as well. Uh, but thank you guys for watching, and we will see you in the next one.